So Armand White, he's this guy, uh, makes movie reviews. He does movie reviews for the National Review, which is what we're on right now. This is the site. Um, Armand White, it says about Armand White there, but I'm just going to go off my recollection of the man, my experience toward him. From what I know about Armand White, he is well known for his, for going against the grain on a lot of films, for outlandish sort of perspectives on film, and he's very unique in what he views to be issues within a film, his areas of focus. You've probably heard infamously that, uh, infamously, I don't want to colour it, I'll let anybody else take with this information whatever they so shall, but um, Armand White, he said that, he said something, I can't remember the specifics obviously, but uh, Jack and Jill, remember, well, that, remember, yeah, remember Jack and Jill, the Adam Sandler film, he had a lot of praise for that one, the, uh, which is, um, which, you know, you're allowed to do, you have every right, and like, you know, every right to say what you think is of quality about Jack and Jill, like, I, like, everyone knows it's a masterpiece, and I'm just, I'm, I'm at least happy that Armand is putting that out there, but, um, yeah, that and Man of Steel, two movies that he believes to be very, very strong, very, uh, I think he talks about how they really live up to American values, something along those lines. I don't want to misrepresent you, Armand, so if I'm saying anything wrong and you just so happen to see this review, which I really hope you do, uh, not review, just a, it's not a, not a stream as well because it's not live or anything because I'm scared. Um, but Armand White, if you so happen to pass this recording... First, I love you and all of your work, every every inch of it. I know m many people would categorize you as the Alex Jones of film reviews, but that doesn't make sense because Alex Jones has reviewed films, so you're different people. And that's why I like you, Armand, because you're different. Um, so yeah, the famous for his reviews of Man of Steel and um, Jack and Jill, um, two movies that were derided by the general public, I think. Um, but um, Armand's derision came from came with another film called Parasite, released in 2019 as well. 2019, I think. I saw it in 2020, but I think that's it was given an extra cinematic push because of the Oscars. But um, so, yeah, he said Parasite was something, something, socialist something. Um, which, you know, you have every right to do on that as well. I, I really enjoyed Parasite. I thought it was pretty strong. I've heard some criticisms. And I don't know, uh, there are a few people who have issues with the with the ending. It's certainly not a perfect film, but I think very strong, great character work, a pretty well put together film. Bong Joon-ho is a very excellent director. But, um, you know, if you don't agree with the, 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 with the politics, then that is totally fine. I didn't really. I found the film to be kind of neutral in its political, whatever I was trying to say. Yeah, sorry, I'm interrupting the review on or this recording on Armand White's review to go off on about Parasite for a second. I always felt like it was kind of neutral on what was good and bad about kind of system because it's like the rich aren't bad people, and well, it's like they're not like horrible, abhorrent people. If anything, they're more ethical like than the Kim family um because that's the, the Park family isn't it the, the, they're the rich ones the Parks like they're kind of rude and sort of I guess naive a little bit stuck up but they're not bad people by any stretch compared to um the Kims where it's like you kind of you feel for them and they're not completely abhorrent people as well but there's a lot more moral grayness with with them, and um, but it's all kind of sympathetic to the situation, and I think there's a lot that you can you can take away from the film, regardless of your politics. But um, yeah, not with Armand, and I think that's why I like him so much, and why we will get back on track to have a look at Toy Story Four and National Anthem. 
that's the title of this review, Toy Story 4 and National Anthem. Pay attention to this article that we will be going through soon. Don't look at anything else on my screen, especially not the fact that I need to update my computer. We're going to have a look at Toy Story 4 National Anthem. I skimmed through this ages ago. I remember it being brought up in a review that was looking at negative criticisms for Toy Story 4, and they brought in Armand to um, discredit a lot of the negative criticisms, which I thought was pretty unfair. In this uh, video, they brought up Armand and didn't really address any of the... Po Say whatever you want about Armand, but at least, you know, engage with what he says about a film, honestly. <laughs> as weird as it might be to say, I know, like like I mentioned before, outlandish. This guy can be a bit over the top, but at that point, it's just like, all you've really got to do is just like, you can either do what I believe to be the, like, I just look at it as for fun. He's kind of like, like I mentioned, Alex Jones sort of vibes, you know, where it, where it is just like, oh, um, and you're the living end. So I think it's kind of the best lens to look at through this. But I remember seeing this video that used uh, Armand White to discredit the negative criticisms of this film, which, you know, Toy Story 4, I had some words to say about it as well. Oh, I've still got Grammarly on. That's right, I use Grammarly because I do whatever I can to make sure my scripts are nice and nice. So if any of that red underlining or anything comes up when I highlight something or other, then I'm sorry because I can't be bothered changing it right now. That's how much I care about this video. Um, yeah, I don't really know if there's anything more else to say, because like I said in this video, um, tried. they also went through a bunch of other people's critics, like, uh, other people's reviews, but they didn't go in depth about the reviews. They kind of shrugged it away. Like, whatever points they tried to validate about the film, this person in question, who I'm not going to name for fun, I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> That's not fair. I think the, the the video that was looking at these criticisms got deleted. But, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, this video that kind of brought the Armand White review into question didn't really engage with his or Armand, uh, yeah, with Armand's or the other reviews that were included in the video very honestly. So that's what I want to do today. I have a look at Toy Story 4 National Anthem. Like I mentioned, I skimmed through it back when I was making my video on Toy Story 4. Um, I can't remember much of it, so that's why I thought it would be fun to go through it today. So I'm going to stop talking shit, and we're going to get onto it. So yeah. <laughs> Already I'm actually... Uh, Toy Story 4, a National Anthem by Armand White... Pixar's latest consumerist indoctrination. So already he's we he's reeled me in. I am like a fish thrashing against the waves, and Armand is just the steady hand with the fishing rod, just just biding its time, waiting for me to bite. And already I think I've dug my teeth, oh, well, fish lips onto the hook. The Toy Story franchise is the closest thing we have to an undisputed national anthem. A popular belief that celebrates what we think we all stand for. Okay, that's that's interesting. Like, I'm interested in what he thinks about this, as if... Because, obviously, Armand is American. Um, the national anthem of America is the Toy Story franchise. Just imagine, like, they get up there and uh, Mariah Carey just gets on the mic. Uh, like, they get up at, like, your know, next major league sporting event in the States and Mariah Carey gets on the mic and she's just like, you've got a friend. Uh, you've got a friend. Anyway, national anthem popularly for we think we all stand for. I didn't get that. Like Toy Story, the national anthem, like people love Toy Story. I did once, one time before something came out. Um, I just never thought of it as the undisputed national anthem. Surely there's other things, especially in American culture, like your national anthem. I don't know. <laughs> For as much as I hear people criticize, you know, America this, America that, you know, home of the free, home of the brave, whatever, whatever. Um, I really feel like I hear the national anthem, like, 
Um, I saw the name Ilan Omar. Okay, this review is going to get spicy, I'm sure, because I think I know on what side of the fence uh, Armand stands. So we're very, very keen to climb up that fence. So um, Undisputed National Anthem. I've never really heard the American National Anthem derided as like a criticized for anything other than when it's like kind of used ironically. Like I remember a lot of punk songs and stuff kind of like, you know, America, home of the free, you know, if that's actually the lyrics, I don't really know too much about the American national anthem other than how to start off again. Something stars and stripes. Um, I think we, all right, let's move on. Cooperation, ingenuity, and simple values such as perpetual hope. I think that's like he's kind of hit almost hit the nail on the head in terms of the themes of the first three well i could say the fourth film as well what it was trying to go for cooperation ingenuity and simple values such as perpetual hope cooperation obviously the movies are all about teamwork ingenuity you know just coming up with new plans to get over like every like obstacle that the gang face um simple values yeah like and one of those simple values being perpetual hope so yeah, Toy Story has never been thematically too deep. Obviously, like, you know, the unintentional questions that they make you ask existentially in terms of just, like, how are these toys alive? It's like, are they... Uh, uh, actually, I was speaking to my housemate, and I think I'll keep that conversation... Like, keep it, keep that seed in the brain about uh, the toys being able to breathe. Like, think on that for a little bit and wait for a conversation that Tim and I have that we've recorded... And I'm going to release, but uh, yeah, just about how they can breathe. So like simple values, yes, but very complex issues on the human condition brought forth by Toy Story. Perpetual hope. Yeah, there's always like, you know, we, as long as we stick together, you know, we'll see through it, you know. And just Woody's sort of unwavering, like as much as he kind of, the hope kind of doesn't waver as it kind of stays with all the toys, you know what I mean? Just like if somebody falls, the other one's there to pick them up. Think about it at the end of Toy Story 1. It's Woody's sort of perpetual hope, like, for for Andy, as far as him loving his toys, when he like when he's talking Buzz up and he's like, you're so awesome, you're up, your head does that whoosh thing, it's like, you are a cool toy. One of the, my favourite scenes in Toy Story um and you know but he gives up for a little bit then but then buzz is like come on sheriff there's a kid over in that house who needs us and he like helps him get the toolbox off it's just like that's the perpetual hope because it sort of bounces off one another character so armand i think i am picking up what you are putting down this fact of our infantile desensitized culture became apparent back in 2010 when i took a knee on toy story 3 and rotten tomato rotten tomatoes sprouted death threats all right (laughs) <laughs> this fact of our infantile desensitized culture this fact of our infantile desensitized culture okay um so it's infantile desensitized for toy story if we if we you know undisputed i'm going to dispute i'm not american but i don't know if i go into like if i ask an american it's like toy story are they gonna put their hand over their heart um, the fact about infantile desensitized culture, infantile and desensitized to enjoy Toy Story. Sort of, well, if you kind of, if you are fucking nationalistic about Toy Story in terms of just, you know, the mere mention of it will have you, your hand over your heart. I guess that is kind of weird. Desensitized. Toy Story has desensitized, desensitized us. I'm going to move on from that. Like, I, I'm Sure. I would think it's just like he just wanted to take a stab at culture and just use Toy Story as the spring for springboard for it desensitized us. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Toy Story was it the uh, sensationalist sort of reports, since it's just sort of like media, you know, headlines, articles, just all the crazy stuff that like think. It, oh no, I'm not gonna go into that. Never mind. Became apparent back in 2010 when I took a knee on Toy Story. I like the way he refers that. I took a knee on Toy Story 3. It's like I got down in the fucking dirt and put my knee on Toy Story 3. I just like pinned it to the ground. You know, it's like you are not getting up. Toy Story 3. No, no. This is this is where Toy Story, this is where the Toy Story ends, motherfucker. 
I love that. It's just, it's so epic. I'm just imagining like, you know, like the Doom poster and it's like Armand White, like, you know, and he's just, he's got all the Toy Story characters just sprouting up trying to attack him and he's just like, not today. He's just blowing them all away. And Rotten Tomatoes sprouted death threats. I just love that idea. Just like Rotten Tomatoes, the site. Um, and I, I like, by the way, good use of sprouted. Obviously a bit of, you know, oh, Rotten Tomatoes. That's a vegetable. Um, fruit. Anyway, um, sprouted death threats. I just love that, like, the death threats came from Rotten Tomatoes themselves. That employees just like, it's just like, Tom, have you finished that death threat for Armand White yet? As if I had made Ilan Omar style comments against the history of America and its institutions. It's like, well, motherfucker, you are going after the national anthem. <laughs> I just love this. Like, it's just like, I haven't said, this is the first time I've full on in depth read. Oh no, I did read the Parasite one. I've forgotten most about that one as well, but inserting the politics and stuff, but I love it because it is so based and red pilled. And I'm not going to comment on it any further because it speaks for itself. Even though, Armand, get your own knee off yourself because you just went after the national anthem. That's the history of America. Toy Story is the history of America. That's what it's all led to. You know. Anyway, the mob like that mob like mania is depicted during a fairly creepy sequence in Toy Story 4 when cowboy doll Woody, voiced by Tom Hanks, explores an antiques and consignment store and is threatened by a menacing phalanx of a look alike, think alike, act alike, pee pee wee by a menacing phalanx of look alike. Oh, okay. Now that's fine. That was like syntax, mate. Think of like actor like Pee Wee Herman dolls. I just love that like he sees his critics as the as the dolls. I feel bad for the dolls in Toy, in Toy Story Four because they, all they do is like uh, Gabby Gabby's bidding, and they just get abandoned by the very end. It's just like who knows what happened? Like when like uh, what was it? Because they escaped the toy store and then like they're in that pram and they had the doll stay in there and a woman comes up and it's just like oh what's that? It's like. Oh no, she was like worried because it's like, oh my God, run away, Prim. I hope the baby's okay. And there's like one of these Pee Wee Herman dolls in there. <laughs> yeah. I suppose it takes and it's threatened by a menacing. I'm, the, the way he's described the scene is pretty weird. So he's exploring it and then he's threatened. Oh no, no, I get what you mean. Because kind of like when they all appear from the side after Gabby Gabby's like, no, you can stay. And then, like, they come out of the out of the corners. I actually like the music in that, and like one of the camera angles as it was going over, showing the four dolls all surrounding the pram. But yeah, obviously there is a lot of kind of you know as much every praise I give this film, I have to. Be like, although, and then there's the other thing that comes up. It's just like, there's always another side to the coin with any sort of praise of this. And you can say that about a, a, a lot of things, but um, it's one of those, um, one of those movies, man, where it's just even, it's like The Last Jedi, where it, like the tiny little things that I can appreciate and sort of have a, you know, surface level appreciation for, they all, like, there's the there's the beef underneath it's like i really like the sauce but the beef underneath it is rotten <laughs> you know it's like, i don't want to say undercooked because who doesn't like a rare bit of steak but um yeah this is oh we'll say it in the opposite direction this is like oh not even overcooked because everything in this movie is undercooked ah oh, god i'm getting away from i'm not going to use any more Oh, that word, God. What is the word for just, like... Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Pee Wee Herman Dolls. It's a Pixar vision of a high-tech lynching. But this mad dash mad dash by revengeful analog gadgets also inadvertently symbolizes the conformity that has taken over amusement culture. It's a Pixar vision of high-tech lynching. Okay. It's a Pixar vision of high-tech lynching. The Pee Wee Herman Dolls? What are you trying to say with this? You're trying to link it back to your overall sort of just like, you know, the national anthem or like the consumerist indoctrination. And you're saying like, 
Oh, you, I get it. You're reading between the lines because the Pee Wee Herman dolls, that's what Pixar really wanted to put in this film, really wanted to get out there and go after the children or the people, the, the nationalists who look to Toy Story for the national anthem. Which, why would you go after? That's American history. Um, Man's just by revengeful analog gadgets also inadvertently symbolizes the conformity that has taken over amusement culture. So you're saying that, oh no, the gadgets are the people. Oh no, I get you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. But is Pixar trying to criticize that? Oh, dude, you are peeling back the layers and I'm sorry. I'm just, I don't think I can wrap my head around some of that in terms of a really cogent thought that's going to, that I can summarize. So I'm just going to go on to the Toy Story franchise proves that movies, especially from Disney and Pixar are produced to be critic proof. Now that's kind of fair, but I don't know if I would get to the same point in the same way as Armin, because I guess my idea is obviously like you've heard the stories about just uh, reviews and stuff, how they're like bought off, like you're not directly, not just like, Hey, give the last of us two a 10 out of 10. And we'll give you a voucher for for the for Alpha IHOP. That's an American thing. Sorry, I'm going after American national anthems like Toy Story and IHOP. They kind of are made in this way. That's just like you know, the, the very you know touchy feely, very superficial kind of sense that you get from Toy Story Four in terms of like because one of the defenses I heard for something like the, the Last of Us Two. Um, I'm going to skirt around the spoilers. I'm not going to go too into like um, there's something that happens in that that one of my friends tried to defend because they felt something. And I just, I don't, I get that. Like I felt something with the thing that they're talking about as well. Like there was emotion to be had because I was emotionally invested similar to The Last Jedi. Um, I'm going to spoil that because fuck it's the Star Wars sequels. Who cares? They're not canon. Um, when Luke dies, it's just like, oh, you know, Luke Skywalker was like, you know, when I was a kid, even though, funnily enough, I was exposed to the prequels and Anakin Skywalker before I was Luke Skywalker, but it's just like, oh, this is Luke Skywalker, you know, the hero of cinema in a lot of ways. Like him or Indiana Jones, James Bond, they're sort of just those pillars of like just um, hero-ness and just seeing them go down in, in this manner. And I was wrapped up in, you know, what the film was trying to present in terms of, um, you know, he came around to his, you know, like, um, you know, it's time for the Jedi to end. But then he, at the very end, he's just like, I, he uses his Jedi-ness across the fucking galaxy to project himself, blah, whatever. And... Yeah, I got wrapped up in that, especially with the with the scenography, with the cinematography that they were presenting with the with the two sons. It was filmed very prettily. It was all very pretty. It was presented in a way where it's like, yeah, the emotion can wrap you up because of your investment, and the presentation is kind of just like, look at how artsy it is. It's he disappeared, but the cape is blowing in the wind, um, and that's how I kind of felt with Toy Story Four, just like with Woody's. Go with with him going at the end because they play that very sappy fucking music holy shit i think that's that might be the only original piece of music that i can recognize because like i mentioned in the review and i didn't go too far into this there's a lot of music that's just straight up reused verbatim as it was in toy story one two and three that you can probably remember um, like there's Zerg's planet plays when Buzz is like on my way, Woody, and he's like doing his slingshot maneuver shit. It's um that dun 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 dun. It's like oh, I love that. Stop using it because you're doing. Sorry, I'm reading a little bit ahead of this article. I've God, why did I decide to do this? I'm gonna get distracted so heavily. Sorry for anyone who's not enjoying this, but I'm going to keep going. Um. Yeah, but I actually kind of agree with the critic proof thing because. Yeah, that ending scene with Woody, it's just like they've got the sappiness, they've got everybody there, they've got the music, and that only original piece of music, because it's just like, it's the tiny violin that's playing just out of frame on the camera as we watch Woody being like, I'm leaving all of you, 
and everyone is totally okay with it. Everyone, everyone's okay. Sorry, I knocked the mic. Um, and yeah, like there's the cognitive, the cognitive dissonance of just pushing aside completely all of the buildup that came to that moment. It's like, we're going to have, we need to have this scene. The scene needs to happen. And the scene happened. It was terrible. But of course, like, I think the general sentiment is that these days when it comes to subverting expectation and the general presence of the feels, it's like that ranks pretty highly with people. Um, with, with critics, sorry, I don't want to say like people. I feel like the people have a better idea of quality than this mainstream critics because mainstream critics are just like, ah, oh, the best things are the things that I am given tickets to go see by the studio when given accommodation at the at the festival that I'll be near, you know, that sort of jazz. So I, Armand, I think you're on the ball. That's what I was trying to, I'm, I was trying to, you say, Armand puts it to page and I try, I'm like an historian on this article. I'm really trying to get into the nitty gritty, see what is hiding in between the words. Anyway, moving on. My heret heretic, uh, how do you pronounce that properly? It's heretical because I know it's heresy. Heretical? Her heretical? I'm going to say heretical. Sorry for anyone who is right if I'm wrong. Uh, my heretical point when writing about Toy Story 3 was that this insulting franchise delim delimited movies, particularly those targeted as, at children, as no longer expressive art, but mere products synony synonymous with toys and the utility of toys. All reflection and imagination is left to the manufacturer. Um, there's nothing for the viewer to do but worship the formula. I disagree heavily. There is a lot of subtext to take away from those films. There's a lot of things to pick up, especially as you grow up. And while it isn't a very subtle franchise, there's a lot to look at in terms of what is being like presented to us. And just like the very simplistic kind of like, the first thing that jumps out to me is kind of like when Woody snubs the handshake from Buzz, uh, when he's like leaving Sunnyside in Toy Story 3, but then when they're saying goodbye, um, when Woody's about to be taken off to college, you know, he gives him that handshake and, you know, if you're not paying attention or you're a little 10 year old child, like I was when I was a 10 year old, 10, 12, I was, I was an, I, I was younger when I went to see Toy Story 3 incidents, that would make sense, I reckon. Um, that escaped my mind when I was a very little kid. Um... And like rewatching it and picking up those little things. There was something else. I was watching it again with my partner recently and I picked something else up. There is there is a bit of takeaway. I get the try what he's trying to say in there, the you know, the kind of you know, it's being there to push products. I would totally agree with Toy Story 4 in a lot of ways. There's not a lot to be said about the new characters. And in some ways that was kind of the case with Toy Story 3 with um the new characters that were introduced in that. Not so much Slotso. He had a lot going on. Ken, there was character there as well. Ken was very entertaining in Toy Story 3. Um, but more like um, Lotso's friends, the sidekicks. But that honestly, that they were kind of like the lackeys or something. And they had their own personalities. But I would agree that there is an essence of, you know, the sort of um, cynical uh, consumerism to try to push those toys. I, I think I understand a little bit here, Armand. Uh, delimited movies, I suppose, particularly those hard as children are no longer expressive art. It's no longer expressive art, but it's no longer expressive art. All reflection imagination is left to the manufacturer. It's just like, but then it's like, obviously you've, you've kind of, you already said they're a manufacturer. So, you obviously don't want to give the credit of like there's expression within this art. Mere products synonymous with toys and the utility toys, utility of toys. That's not fair as well. There's a lot of like that was that's the main point of this fucking franchise is how toys are unused like with kids animation of oh, kids animation <laughs> imagination and the thing different things and scenarios you could come up with. That's kind of that was the point of another um what was it, uh, the short film where I think it was tr uh, Toy Story of the Time Forgot, Trixie is, pr is um, 
Bonnie uh, refers to Trixie as her reindeer, and then she uses a Christmas ornament as a dinosaur in her playtime, switching out their roles instead, and Trixie's having a, having a bit of an identity crisis. And it's kind of like, oh, I don't want to be a reindeer, I'm a dinosaur. But it's just like, it's, it's Bonnie's imagination. She's having a lot of fun with just, like, putting them into different scenarios and just, like, just because they're specifically this toy. Like, think about when you buy a toy from a an established um, franchise. Like, think about... I remember having a Yoda toy um, from the prequels, I think it was, and, you know, uh, it was it was kind of cool, but, like, um, <laughs> God, so weird with the toys when we were kids, like, it, uh, oh, this is going to sound so sadistic, but it has a face that you could kind of take off because it was a lot more rubbery, and then, like, underneath you have the eyes bulging out of the, um, the plastic sort of uh, protector that, like, holds all the mechanics in there that move the mouth and eyes when he's doing all of his, you know, sort of just like, he's like, that is why you fail. And just all the Yoda-isms. Um, and, you know, we kind of use that as just like, you know, T-1000 Yoda coming to fucking get you. Uh, or T-800 more like T-1000 obviously liquefies. Um, yeah, but like the movies do that, it's like, you know... The, the aliens are attacking evil Dr. Pulchop or, like, um, One-Eyed Bart. Like, you know, that's that's a pretty, like, cute uh, thing for somebody to to do in terms of, like, that's... You could say that's down to the manufacturer kind of expressing that imagination, but, you know, taking out one of the eyes of Mr. Potato Head and saying this, like, and he hides him, his identity by, you know, having both eyes in. But then, like, he's known as One-Eyed Bart. And, like, they take out the art. Uh, the art? They take out the eye... At the start of Toy Story 1, so that, like, he's just like, I'm here to stop you, one-eyed Bartons. It's like, oh, how'd you know it was me? And it's just, and it's just like, oh, yeah. Like, you're kind of using the toy's abilities to express their character and have a sense of imagination. It's just like, even outside of the playtimes that the characters have, it's just like, even the place in the story, there's some um, creativity with that, especially with, um with Mr. Potato Head still, and I'd say, like, Slinky, and how they're used to get the toys out of jams and kind of explore all those opportunities. Like, it's... It's it's, it's all there. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with this one, Armand. I've, I've been completely with you every step of the way thus far, but this I'm going to have to take a step back. It goes on. In Toy Story 4, the familiar characters, including Buzz Lightyear, Tim Allen, are joined by a new creation, Forky. Uh, joined by a new creation. Forky is not an expensively manufactured doll, but a doohickey hair made by Bonnie. This story's new human child progenitor. A mi- <laughs> I'm not going to read that part, whatever. Um... Bonnie invests wishing into Forky, a plastic spork outfitted with pipe cleaner arms and pasted on eye decals. No decals, decals, yeah. No different from a perfectly used rag doll, Forky recalls the lonely desperation of Blade Runner's toy maker who said he made his friends himself. Yeah, Forky's, Forky's weird, Forky's creepy. And they don't, it would have helped a lot if everyone was helping with the, with this new arrived fork but they made it just uh woody's oh my god he gives an grammarly oh thank you i guess yay (sighs) fucking forky um if this is a criticism of forky i agree with it (laughs) but um it recalls the lonely desperation of blade runners yeah there's there's some there's a lot of weird stuff about forky and there's a lot of rush sort of just like you know just like i'm barney's trash and just I feel like it's even more confusing with Forky's character in terms of what he doesn't know, the discrepancy between what he does know and what he doesn't know, especially with, um, he knows what he's meant to be used for. He understands the concepts of annoyance and, um, you know, freedom, essentially, like jumping out the car at the RV, freedom. He understands his purpose as far as what he was once used for, what he was disposed of, but he doesn't know bunch of these other things it's kind of like if i can bring it up the um forky asks a question series where it's like he doesn't know what time is he doesn't know what all these little this and that like it was weird with buzz like in terms of like what he didn't know what he didn't know it was played off for a bit of um 
comedy in the first one is like he would he saw the world through a a space ranger's perspective of just like you know just like uh, it's like has your plan has your civilization civ- um, civilization also discovered uh oh what was it fossil fuels or crystallic fusion and um but then and then he calls it's like where's that universal bonding strip it's like mr lightyear once more tape so it's kind of just what he understands of the world is coming from this um more space ranger perspective but forky what is his perspective it is so pick and choose and maybe that's kind of the point he's put together but it really feels like kind of a lazy writing trick in terms of what you know the the consistency of his character it's like I guess even then it's just like he's too content at too soon of a time if this is also on top of like his understanding of the will you know as soon as um as soon as Woody gives him is like your your Bonnie's trash he gives him that new sense of purpose he is pretty chill for the rest of the film other than like Woody's you know uh when he gets kidnapped and shit but otherwise, he's pretty. Like, he gets over his existential crisis pretty quickly, and they don't. Yeah, just think about if they did the Buzz thing. Imagine if Buzz saw the um, the advertisement for his toy self, like near the start of the film, at the end of the first act, shortly after he and Woody get lost. I really feel like it wouldn't have had the same sort of payoff that it had because I think. That kind of ends Act Two, I think, um, with him going off to um, sorry. It ends Act Two when he, you know, with his above the stars are so, you know, like um, sailing no more, you know, um, and just when he tries to fly. Another one of my favorite scenes in Toy Story. A fair few of them include Buzz. Go figure. What the fuck were we talking about? <laughs> but, oh, yeah, just kind of comparing that with Forky's lonely desperation of Blade Runner's toy maker. I have a terrible confession to make. I've never seen Blade Runner. But I understand to an extent... I'm going to move this cable so I'm, I don't whack into it anymore. Sorry, for Sorry, sorry, you're hearing a bit of... All right, it's gone now. Um... But understanding the kind of the some of the base points of Blade Runner and Do Androids Dream of an Electric Sheep, I remember skimming through that book in high school, at least uh, part of a liter- literature cl- uh, literature class. I know, like you know, androids play a huge part in it, and just uh, the ideas and same made his friends himself. I think this is a bit of a weird thread to pull out, a bit of a. He's trying to segue into this point of just like, you know, Ahmed White is like, oh, look, I watched Blade Runner. And just like, fuck you, I haven't. <laughs> um, no, not fuck you. Sorry, Ahmed. You know I love you. Um, I'm going to move on from that point. I think there's a lot that we could sort of vamp on it for a bit, but we need to get through this. But that notion is even darker and more complicated than Pixar's nihilistic Wally. Nihilistic? Wally is not nihilistic. God, it's... It's sort of depressing when it starts off, but do you really see it going any other way in some regards? Like, I think it's a very realistic portrayal of where we get... Like, it might have been too soon on the... Um, on the prediction, if I can remember just, like, when exactly all that's supposed to happen. Although, isn't it meant to be, like, thousands of years um, after, like, kind of where we are now, modern times, when they finally return, and it's very hopeful in terms of, like, when they return, and like, oh, we can recreate this, and we can start again, it's like, all we need is just that little spark, and we just, like, we need to keep ourselves in check, we need to remember what you, what we appreciate about life, and I think a big element of that was taking the humans out of the earthly scenario, and it's just, like, if we put them on a ship and let them, like, divulge in their base desires like i can i can sort of see how there's elements of it where it's like kind of nihilistic it doesn't obviously portray humans in the most flattering of lights but it doesn't say the lost causes either it just it's very kind of realistic i mean look at what you're saying about kind of you know where this movie and like toy story as a whole you know the national anthem of america 
is pushing us in terms of like, you know, the mindless consumerism that you so, you know, that you go back to in terms of kind of where we're going with all this. So I was like, Wally, is it that much of a stretch that we could, that it's a potential for what could happen if we don't keep ourselves in check? We like, you know, it's like some, like what if we went full throttle into all of that? Not really. Like I would say it's, Certainly not unrealistic. I know you haven't said that. That's that's the thing. It's just like if I spoke to you, Armand, I'd be curious as to whether you find Wally realistic or not. But nihilistic, I disagree. But I also digress. Thus, Bonnie's awkward Asperger spectrum imagination. <laughs> um. Okay. You're very mean. <laughs> Asperger Spectrum Imagination brings unfair competition to Pixar's toy monopoly. So Porky is characterized as a snarky, neurotic outcast, an existential threat to the regular toy characters. He's not really a threat. He's just like, he's, in, he's a new... He's a new perspective on things, and it's not really seen as a threat to the status quo. It's just a challenge to overcome, a challenge that, for some w reason, Woody bestows on himself entirely because he's got this weird quasi sort of selfish selflessness throughout this entire film that kind of flips his original character um, projection from the first three. <clears throat> Excuse me, first three. An existential threat. I'd say like he's existentially a threat to himself in a lot of ways. And as I, I think it was um, uh, Southpaw uh, on the EFAP that um, was covering this, was covering Toy Story 4, he said, it's just like, what it's just like, it's just like, fork you, there's something you got to know about the trash. My friends and I, like, we never had, like, the nicest relationship with trash. We always thought it's like, where are we, where are we going to go? It's just like... And you could say that's mean to view trash that way. I understand you have this warm, fucking fuzzy feeling, whatever. But um, we went into the trash, and where it was trying to send us was this fiery inferno. So I kind of butchered on what it could potentially be. But yeah, missed opportunity there. Next essential threat to the regular toy characters were easily marketable tie-ins. I'd say Forky is marketable in a lot of ways because it is just like, oh, look at this fucking thing. Isn't it adorable? This little dibby that's just like, it's, look at it. It's, 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 it's weird. And like, you look at how hard they've pushed the marketability. That's why I started off my review with a PowerPoint presentation on just like, you know, this sort of downward spiral is like, oh my God, what is this disgusting abomination, Forky? Um... Uh, he's like neurotic outcast. He's like, he's sort of as much of an, out like, oh yeah, I guess I can't really disagree with you there in terms of like, he is an outcast initially, but as you think about that by the time they get to, it's just like, what he said to meet him there. And he kind of is already just a part of the crew by the very end. He's just got his own, you know, sort of personality traits that make him different in terms of like, you know, it's just like, you know, just he just looks at people and goes, bah, 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 bah. Well, oh, that's supposed to, no, because that was, that was Bo, sorry. There was a reason for him saying that, because he was like saying that, like, it sounded like the exact same audio of when he said that earlier in the film, so that was weird. Um, anyway, moving past that. Um, yeah, I guess there's existential threat to the regular toy characters. I guess because it is just like, it's like, what's marketable anymore? <laughs> Pixar can fucking make this goddamn Forky character. I'd say Forky is more marketable than Ducky and Bunny. They thought that was going to be a thing, I'm sure. You know, I've... I'm not down in the... I'm not quite aware of what toys are popular these days. As far as I know, it's just fucking digital toys on Roblox. But I've got little brothers, and they've got Toy Story merchandise. They don't have anything from the fourth film, as far as I know. And when we talked about this, I, I promise you, I didn't put this into, um, put this into their heads. They think Toy Story 4 is not very good as well, just saying. And that's from, that's from the target audience, you know, the ones who stand up for the Toy Story National Anthem. I mean, they're not Americans, so that's the thing. 
say, uh, Armand, you're wrong. It's the international anthem. Anyway, yeah, I don't really have anything more else to say that existential threat to the regular toy characters who are easily marketable tie-ins. I like, just like the idea. So it's like, it's, Woody's like, oh no, I'm not as marketable anymore. Well, that's kind of like, that's sort of what they're fucking, oh God, Armand, maybe you are more based than I thought. Is there more after this? Oh, thank God. Uh, Toy Story 4's unsurprising journey home plot. Yeah, I agree with that. It's just, you know, they're doing the first Toy Story again. It's like, look at the twists and turns. Practices big tech industrial hypnotism. Yes. Moving on. Fans, Pixarnoids, I love this. Pixarnoids. No definitions available. You got a definition for Forky, but not the damn Pixarnoids. You don't think outside the toy chest or even care about the development of ideas. We'll settle for routine, politically correct placation. As far as I know, Armand, actually, it's like, no, you're not as based as I thought you were. It turns out this isn't politically correct. I've seen a few articles that claim that the film is ableist, um, ageist, uh, homophobic, and racist for reasons. I have no idea, and I didn't really... Like, that's just like... In as much as I was like, you know, I felt like I was fueling on negative criticism of Toy Story 4. So I was like, I was like sussing out just these negative takes to see. It's like, what are other people saying bad about this film? Like, what can I numb my head at and try to avoid? Because I don't want to be saying the same things in the review. Um, But yeah, there were some artic articles that were saying that there was a lot of issues because, oh, what was it? Because they were saying because it's still a pr predominantly white cast and like um something about ducky and bunny being tokens it was very weird points and um excuse me oh i think they were saying that like with woody getting his voice box taking out um like that's ableism because you know it's like oh it's so sad that he's not as he was he's like less of a person because he's had part of him taken away it's just like it's just like, I guess only in the superficial, like what I said in the review, it's just like, he's still Woody. He's had his voice box taken away, but that his voice box isn't him. And I can kind of agree that that was kind of a misguided point that they were making in Toy Story 4 by saying that it's like he's taken away the toy, to, toy box, the toy box. Oh my God. The toy, what, if, voice box. That's the words. I'm a bit tired. This may devolve soon. I've got to, I've got to power through, but um, politically correct placation. No, Armand, you're wrong. Noid. Um, this comes in the form. Okay, politically correct placation in Woody's All Flame Bo Peep. I did not want to touch the. I saw some criticisms about Bo Peep being overly feminist, and I made a joke about. Uh, I included the gaslight gay keep girl boss meme in the in the video because I thought that was like it's just like a, I was pay paying a tiny little bit of lip service to that because I thought there may have been something I, I thought it was just weird about you know yeah the empowerment thing it's like oh you're going into a little bit here actually um fuck, where was I sorry everyone. Hold on. Let's reel back. Yes. But I, I don't know. It's just, it's not really for me to say in terms of how woke or SJW this movie is in terms of, like, you know, Bo's character. I just, I liked the idea of her actually becoming resilient and, you know, really strong in, in and of herself. That's why I appreciated the one scene that I thought was just like, okay, that's still okay. And that's the, um you know, the scene where her arm falls off and Woody's like, uh, and she's like laughing it off. Um, I thought it's like, oh, that was funny. That was not, not funny. Like nothing in this movie is funny, but, um, yeah, there was, there was that. <laughs> that's the only thing I really appreciated about her characterization. Um, that's what I wanted to focus on. Just the mechanics of that characterization rather than the politics surrounding it. She even instructs Woody about change. Yeah, so I would definitely say she's very condescending in uh, Toy Story 4. And, um, yeah, the way she, I do not appreciate the way that she talks to Woody. 
in that movie and acts like he's in the wrong for all these things and puts him down for his sense of purpose. The sense of purpose that she, for a second, kind of shows some sympathy towards in, like, when she's looking off kind of sad and, like, with that, uh, what I mentioned as the tell don't show about her, um, past relationship with Mo- uh, Molly. So, yes, um, and that's all I'm going to say. I'm just like, we'll be like, Bo's character is terrible. It's like, yes. And you're like, because she's a, f- a f- it's politically correct. I'm like, oh, I just think the mechanics of her character are broken. Anyway, moving on. But if Toy Story fans are also film students, Pixar has given rise to a new category of unapologetic but not necessarily cinema-oriented geek. Oh, okay. <laughs> if Toy Story fans are also film students. I'm not a film student. I'm a music student, prick. Um, uh, Pixar has given rise to a new category of unapologetic but not necessarily cinema-oriented uh, geek. Okay, so you're saying it's just like someone who's not too familiar with the cinema. I will have you know, my history with film begins in Blockbuster. Blockbuster video uh, in my hometown. My dad, he was known as the Blockbuster guy because he was the manager there for like, like two decades. Um, not at that specific store, he was more like the area manager and stuff, and he was known as the blockbuster guy, and it was legendary because I would go in, I would just, I would look around at all the blockbuster stuff, and it would like I just, oh fuck, who misses blockbuster as well? It's kind of like when I when that closed down, it's like ah, oh, the library's closing down. Anyway, moving past that, it's like, it's like, yes, Armand, I am not necessarily cinema oriented, I guess in your definition potentially. Uh, Let's have a talk about it sometime. This is my open invitation to you to, like, just talk. <sighs> it's just like, bro, people disturb their passive enjoyment. Um, I, I'm a Toy Story fan. I'm not a film student, but bro, people definitely disturbed my passive enjoyment. Although, like, I think as I mentioned in the, the the end of the review, I was pretty passive about it and overlooking a lot of the issues until the very ending, and I was like, wait a second. Then I went back and had a look and just like, oh, my God, this movie. Because, like, there were moments where it was, like, legitimately dipping, but I was like, oh, let's just wait for the end. It's all going to come together and it's going to be fine. Because I, I, I feel like I remember having that similar sort of feel during Toy Story 3 because I don't think I thought it was as good as Toy Story 1 and 2. But I still enjoyed it. I was still enjoying it. And I still thought that there was a lot. Like, you know, I was like, oh, they're pulling it together. There's like some dips, but they're doing really well. And this is when I was 12. And honestly, I feel like what, re-watching Toy Story, like when I watched Toy Story 4 for the first time, I was put back in that mindset because I was like, oh my God, it's, a, it's the toys from Toy Story. <laughs> And I was just like staring wide eyed, just like it's so cool to see these like characters again, and just like oh man, look how pretty the animation is. And then I got to the end, and I'm just like fuck you, what have you done? Um, so yes, it disturbed my passive enjoyment. As a digital creation, Bo Peep's plasticine sheen and feminine curves. All right, recall Robert Zemeckis's eerie Welcome to Marwen where female doll figures, whether heroic or villainous, came to life as representations of the social fears and psychopathology of its damaged protagonist, Mark Hogenkamp, Steve Carell. Welcome to Marwin flopped because it fell between family movie escapism and a social justice victimhood tract. Zemeckis couldn't navigate reality and fantasy and then trivialise the issue of post-traumatic stress by using superficial high-tech placebo. You have such a way with words. I didn't get any of that. <laughs> I, can't, I don't know this Welcome to Marwin movie. Probably because it fell between. It's just like, this movie doesn't understand the difference between escapism and social justice victimhood track. Or kind of just like the between reality and fantasy. I could see that. There's kind of... Where does it want to be absurd? Where does it want to be realistic? Like with the characters of Ducky and Bunny, just like, it really wants to have that absurdity. And same with, um, with Forky. But then they... F- it's like they do that in disregard to just everything that came before and all the other characters that are involved. 
Um, oh, are we nearing the end? No. Um, FX courtesy of DreamWorks cousin to Disney Pixar. Cousin to Disney. They're not in the... I guess like fucking second cousin twice removed or some shit. Let me try to... You know they don't like each other, right? <laughs> I'm I'm gonna like just say Jeffrey Katzenberg. I'll put that out there. Hey, I'll let you do the rest, Armand. If you're watching this, I know you definitely are. You absolutely are, because your name is involved. And yeah, what a at least recognizing the desire to escape into childhood fantasy gave Welcome to Marwin substance worthy of viewers' attention. Okay, recognizing the desire to escape into childhood. As the Toy Story 4 recognized the escape in childhood fantasy because it's fucking childish in the fantasy. It wants Woody to reobtain and act as if like he had kind of suppressed the entire time. It's just it's like, we're trying to say, at least the movie did something. At least the movie tried. So Toy Story 4 tried, sure. It had a really nice coat of paint over fucking house without foundations but yeah having exposed hollywood's animated anthropomorphic impulse all right it relates to the current eric <laughs> i've gone down the rabbit hole and i don't know how to climb back out it's it leads to the current era of political hoaxes in which the struggle for political power control of the narrative Reveals a, lo a loss of conviction and sense of futility. There is someone with a voice who I'm just trying to remember. Has he talked about the fucking film? He hasn't talked, like, gone about the plot, really, or the characters. Like, he's skimmed over them, but he hasn't really talked about, like, why it doesn't work. It just says, it's just like, it's fucking SJW. Which, whatever. Having... Where am I? I'm looking at the words, and I know I can read them, but I just do... Oh, excuse me. I feel so lost, I just... I don't know if it is a loss of conviction and sense of futility. Sure. I'm going to just say yes, because you are a smarter person than me. But when Pixar introduces a new stuntman doll named Duke Kaboom, he is redundant. Oh, Armin, I love you. That is, that is so true. That's easily the best thing you've said in this review. It, you may not have really qualified it very well, but yes, I absolutely agree that the character of Duke of Boom just feels like such a cardboard cutout of Buzz in terms of just like, you know, it's just like, it's like, oh, Buzz can't, couldn't fly like he could in the thing. It's like, Duke could jump like he could in the thing. He has a, sort of naivete and like sort of dumbness and he's like he's a hero figure yeah i agree i agree and as much as duke boom is probably one of the better new characters by default let's have a quick little um all right who are the new characters you've got uh uh, we'll say the new characters in the new gang that Woody's a part of, the new and better gang, the gang he's going to be happier with. He's going to be happier with Gigawick Dimples, who laughs at his past and what potentially has traumatic incidences. He, she laughs at that and says it's nothing. It's... Why, Woody? Why do you need those people... Ducky and Bunny who are beating up your friend. Bo who puts you down and has terrible plans that gets everybody in danger. Fucking Keanu Kaboom. Just not knowing. Just, just being Buzz but not Buzz. Not a good Buzz. Uh, there is not enough salt. For... Yeah, anyway. Moving on. <laughs> but I agree. I can't remember what I also was saying about it, like, behind it, but yes. Uh, Duke Kaboom offers, voiced by Keanu Reeves, Duke Kaboom offers nothing else, nothing close to the giddy delight of that relentless, surreal slapstick taxi cab battle in John Wick 2. Hmm. 
he likes John Wick too. I'm going to have to go off of your suggestion. So I'm going to like one day probably watch every movie that you've mentioned here, even if it's the one you've uh, you've shown derision to. You're fucking wrong about Wally. <laughs> Wally is like top five Pixar easily. What are the other movies? You say so. I've got to watch Blade Runner. I need to watch these to understand your review. Welcome to Marwin and John Wick Two. I haven't seen John Wick One, but I am going to watch John Wick Two. Ugh. All right. <clears throat> Offers nothing else close to the. Yeah, that's kind of like. Duke doesn't really have anything cool in the way of his actions. Like he's, it's just, it's it's kind of funny. He's give he's got he gives a few chuckles, but his chuckles are at the expense of making fun of. Um, Buzz and Jesse, as you mentioned before, in terms of him having the similar motivations. But whereas Buzz, there's kind of a there are jokes to be made about it, but it is really sad. You think it's like it's like his entire life has been a lie, however long that entire life was. Then, yeah, stuff happened. Yeah, the less enjoyable franchise it perpetuated by Toy Story Four. Pixar continues to indoctrinate viewers into childish, compulsive consumerism. Maybe we'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, I'm just gonna say yes. You have like the Buzz Lightyear point. It's like fuck yeah, Armand. Go on, everybody. That's that's Armand right there. That's his archive page. I, I can't. You're way better than me, Armand. I didn't. I don't have an archive page. Armand White is a culture critic, writes about movies for National Review, and is the author of New Position, The Prince Chronicle, Chronicles. Chronicles. His new book, Makes Spielberg Great Again, The Steven Spielberg Chronicles, is available at Amazon. I don't know what that is. Someone's, is that his? Three times chair. 18. I was, oh, 18 comments. Oh, shit. Should we have a, we'll have a quick look. Okay, adding an extra, however long this review is going for. Um, but, 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 oh, it's politics now. Let's stay away from that. Let's stay away from politics. After this review was politics. Let's have a look at the comments. Are these the comments? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you fucking talk shit about Armand. I remember the story of the man guarding the Mona Lisa and a viewer scornfully mutters, I don't think it's that great. The guard leans toward the viewer and whispers, the painting is, is no longer being critiqued. The viewer is. All right. Whatever. <laughs> My husband and I took our granddaughters this past week to see Toy Story 4 and I barely laughed and then sobbed and left with dark glasses on. Left with dark glasses on. Like your, <laughs> your glasses got darkened by watching the film. It's just like, as you were watching the film, they just, like, went to a sepia filter. Um, what's this little handshake thing? Is that, like, that's their version of likes? Just pressing on the handshakes? Huh? I'll have to log in, so I won't click on that. If I have to. So I've left with dark glasses. I'm comforted with... Comforted that other parents and grandparents felt the same. I feel chagrin for Anna in getting it so wrong. <laughs> See, feel, believe, despair, rejoice, kafar, joy. Sometimes just feeling anything rather than outrage at imbeciles feels plain no good. For heaven's sakes, the toys tell us about ourselves, and you know that. So just go with it and have one hour and 40 minutes of happiness at feeling something akin to the occasional proverb pr 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 entreaty. Yes! You got him. Made a court, eh? <laughs> Made a court? However you pronounce that. I'm getting words so wrong in this, but oh well. I saw Toy Story before with my kids. I didn't see in it all the horrors that Armin sees, but I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was say that it isn't great. <laughs> uh, okay, but I'll say that it wasn't great. So yes, Corey. Watching the Toy Story movies is a bit like listening to Rage Against the Machine. It's like, oh, cool, they made the same album again. Neat. Toy Story movies are all decent, but they basically made the same movie four times in a row. No, they have not. Yes, there's similar elements to kind of like, you know, would he get separated from the team? Has to find them again. At least in the third one, it was more of a choice he made himself. Although, by accident, yeah, that's very, like, 
all right, I can see they're the same fucking movie. At least the second one just did it better. Um, Armand, you're the best film critic writing in my humble opinion. I'm sure you won't let them grind you down. Yes, Steve Ox. We are all on our side. Oh, I like, so yeah, you press that and this, it's like this comment was given two handshakes. Pope Sixtus the, is that six? I think that's six. Pope Sixtus the Sixth. NI is never going to cover it unless they do, but the actual reason we're in this mess is because Disney screwed up the public domain. Yep. When the lobbied when when the lobbied Congress for bigger and bigger extensions on copyright expirations until now, where it's like ninety years plus, and they're probably going to extend it again with nothing going into the public domain. All Disney can do is remake their old stuff. Um. Yeah, they can also make new stuff. <laughs> they're pretty good at that. They're doing that sometimes, especially Pixar. They're not remaking something unless, like, we look at Corey's point and like they made the same movie again. Uh, Rage Against the Machine. It was like. It's like, oh, I should. I, I guess I should come come to bat for Rage Against the Machine. It's like I like some Rage Against the Machine. There, yeah, that's my defense. But yeah, like yeah, the copyright bullshit with um, uh, the thing, Disney, is bullshit. Yeah, I agree. Oh, this one has eight handshakes. Oh dear, a movie for children that features toys. The horror, the horror. Haha. <laughs> I don't know. Did he say it's just like where in his review did he say it's all the toys? Straw man him, Diamond, Diamond Lil. All right here comes Fat Albert with ten handshakes to say, I must say, Armand, that you are consistent. Is he though? <laughs> Pick your popular movie. Well, eviscerate said movie, then move to next popular movie. Occasionally, take time out to extol the virtues of some obscure film that nobody's seen or cares about. Ah, the life of a contrarian film critic rising above the hoi polloi of common film viewers. I know it must be fun to be so much smarter than everybody else. Hopefully that makes up for being so miserable everything you watch. Miserable everything you watch a movie. Damn you, Fat Albert. Armand is a saint, and he tells it like it is, and it is like he tells it. Duke Roberts, two handshakes, spot on. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with this characterization of Mr. White. However, I, oh, it's Mr. White, where's the next review? Oh, no voices. However, I think society is the richer for it. Sometimes I feel like slapping someone after what seems like the millionth time I hear they love Frozen. Oh, so what? Let them like it. It's kind of the thing. If somebody says they like Toy Story 4, I'm like, okay, it's great. If they say it's a good movie, though, then it's like... Sorry, that I'm going to try to compress that in post and make sure that wasn't that loud. Moving on. I often enjoy crappy movies. Oh, you said that, you said that yourself. Ugh. So it's like, if they say they love it, it's like, it's, it's, you know, whether or not they like or love, let people love what they want to love. Some people love Frozen. Some people like Toy Story 4. I love Armand White. You're going to slap me. Kunamu. I think that's I tell really caught you. Um I often enjoy crappy movies, but I try to at least be aware that they are actually that they actually are crappy. Yeah. Maybe that's like if somebody says, I love Frozen, and it's just like, you know it's crappy, right? It's like, yeah, I just love it. What are you gonna do then? Are you gonna slap them still? Uh Many people meander through life perfectly ignorant, believing that Toy Story 4 is God's gift to film. I've never seen anyone say that. I've seen people say that it's the best of the franchise, and they're wrong. Uh, if it's their favorite one, I'm like, oh, okay. Sure, go ahead. Uh, whether or not Toy Story is meaningless, consumerism... Hey, he said mindless. I will not read the review, daddy-o. Oh, it's cringe. It's not cringe that his name is Daddy O, it's just cringe that I said Daddy O and the way that I said it. The art style has always been horrendous to me. Pixar has never made a beautiful film. <laughs> Does anyone challenge the fact that hand drawn animation was the peak? I've seen some hand drawn animation that's worse than this. Have you seen most adult animated. Oh, it's, that's hand drawn. In terms of, uh, if we go hand drawn and say like 2D animated, which is like. Hand sculpted, hand drawn. 
It's like, I don't know, hands drew this. They just drew it with mouses or with stylus pens. Digital art and hand drawn are two different forms. Comparing one to the other is like comparing an oil painting to a watercolor and complaining the other watercolor lacks the vibrancy of the oil. Yeah, Fat Albert coming in with a swing with five, eight handshakes. Why don't I read that as five? Yeah, whatever. It's just like they're kind of two different things and like, you could still say it's like, I, I, like why the animation is better in one thing and not the other. If they're two, if one is hand drawn and the other is so and so, so and what. Except not all watercolor paintings are painful to look at. I'm just a CG racist. Deal with it. I kind of like that as a. It's like sorry, Daddy. Yo, I know you're not saying this exactly, but it's like I'm just a racist. Deal with it. <laughs> it's just I know you're a CG racist, so that's not a actual racist. It just it just sounded funny. I'm just let me have my joke, Daddy. Yo, I try not to defame you. I said like I hope this isn't doxing. Like you guys commented this, so there you go. I don't have to, it's your problem with three handshakes. Good job, Fat Albert. I don't agree at all. That's like saying postmodern art is a different form than classical frescoes and we can't compare the two. Academics and artists constantly debate and interpret the two forms. And objective, or oh, reasonable arguments can be made in favor of one or the other at any time. Kanoe, do you... Are you objective? Do you know... <laughs> Dutch Vandal says, I bet Armand White is super fun at parties. You know what? I reckon he fucking is. I, I want Armand White to come to my birthday party and punch the clown. Oh, he's not a violent man, I'm sure of it. But four handshakes says, I also genuinely bet Armand White would be really fun at parties. Sandor Clegane, ugh, Game of Thrones, says... Um, I'm not sure I agree with your assessment of TS at all, at least TS3, as I haven't seen the fourth one yet. Quite frankly, I always thought of Pixar movies as free of politics. Ew. I mean, yeah, this depends which one you're talking about. What are the politics of cars, you know, other than like highway extensions that bypass town into roads? You know, it's just like we need to like go against the government to say... Just like stop bypassing our beautiful little town. Our town. Remember that? that was a sad scene. The first cars is fine, you know. Wally, dark and nihilistic. I'm just not seeing it. Yeah, I agree. It's not really dark and nihilistic. It's it's dark. It's probably like well, other than Soul. That Soul's not as good as Wally, but not by any stretch. I think Soul is the closest one that's like, oh, Pixar, you piqued my interest in terms of like the story is pretty fucking botched in Soul, but the characters are decent and the concepts explored are pretty interesting. Because it's unfortunate they couldn't stick the landing on some of the mechanics of the story. I'm just not seeing it. Though. Perhaps my problem is that I try to see the good movies before picking them apart. Unless you can see the social justice crap coming from a mile away. Um, That's your... I never saw Bonnie as mixed race. Not many people did, and I don't think it's really a whatever. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares what race Bonnie is? Toy Story 3 was a great coming-of-age movie. Oh, coming-of-age to describe Toy Story 3? I can see it as that. Woody kind of comes of age, and the and Andy does in some ways. I saw a lot of humor in the Spanish Mary Buzz, but not because he was so over-the-top machismo in his quest to win Jesse, but because it exposed how many toys have software, and that software can be buggy in amusing ways. I agree. I kind of I liked exploring that. I know a lot of people say it's, it kind of sucked that we didn't have the real buzz for a fair portion of that film. I thought it was entertaining at least, but yeah, I could definitely agree. It would be cool to see like what buzz would actually be like in those scenarios, especially since like he's just like he's in the rubbish. I kind of like how quickly he is. He doesn't have like much of the context unless he got it while they were in the garbage truck on the way to the tip, like where they fully filmed them in. Like, I can't imagine there would be quite a story. Like, and then you turn Spanish and then, uh, uh, and then the, the baby was sitting creepily on a swing and looked around like, Vroom! and then was like charging after us and the monkey was like, Aah! and we had to sub the monkey with tape. And, uh. But yeah. Um, not because he was so over the top of Kismo because, I mean, it was over the top of Kismo and his quest to win Jesse. I loved like, no matter what, like it's like, if Buzz is regular, like he, regular, if he's, if he's either Spanish or normal, um, oh no, 
Uh, that's not what I mean. I mean, if he's just like the original Buzz that we know, he he really he cares a lot about Jesse. Even when he's factory reset, he recognizes like he he does like Jesse to some extent. It's just like you're good, you're positive. whatever he says, something good looks, and then smoldering good looks or something like those things. And then when he's Spanish, he's just like, oh, I will die for you. <laughs> it's just like it's it, it was kind of sweet that like they were still able to do that character the character stuff. It's like I love it. Just like it's ingrained in him to care about Jesse. All right. Uh, what were we up to? Not because it expressed how many toys I saw. Yeah. There was a great message about standing up to and even helping bullies and turning the other cheek instead of forming a mob for revenge. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, I could say that. Standing up to, helping the bullies. Like, even, it's just like, Lotso didn't really, I guess you could say, he didn't really earn the assistance that Woody and Buzz gave him, and he definitely didn't appreciate it or follow through and, like, returning the favor. And that's why... Yeah, the great message of instead of just like, oh, should we go after him? It's just like, nah, just leave him. He's not for us to worry about anymore. We gave him a chance. We helped him. It's just like we did it out of the kindness of our hearts. And he didn't return that. So, yeah, I agree with the... It was a great message about standing up to bullies. Absolutely. I love Jesse's forthrightness and just the toys aren't going to take it lying down. They're really going to say it's just like, you're a liar and a bully. It's like one of my favorite Jesse moments because it kind of has a very simple sort of bluntness and just like, and it kind of like almost a childish kind of flair, a youthful sort of thing to it. I don't know. It's hard to describe because like Jesse is just so forthright. Here and Buzz, man, they're great characters. Well, they were great characters. Then this Toy Story 4 thing happened. Um, instead of forming a moment for revenge, it's like, yeah. I will be seeing the fourth installment with my wife and possibly our two-year-olds. Don't do it. Don't do it. What's your name? Uh, Sandor. Don't see it. Don't go watch it. You probably already have. Ah, it's been two years. Uh, If you can sit through it, I'll pass judgment on it until then. That's a pretty reasonable response. That's probably the best comment I've seen out of these so far. Wally was kind of dark and nihilistic, but so what? It also offered hope and cute robots to laugh at. It was a beautiful movie. Armin just loves to be the contrarian. Duke Roberts, four handshakes. Report. No, I'm joking. Yeah, it was kind of, it was a lot darker than previous Pixar movies and some of the modern Pixar movies. Uh, had a, like, had a very unique tone that it just was able to sustain through the whole movie that just... It's so hard to describe, but I love that movie. I'd love to talk about it one day to some capacity. Um, but yes, I gave it Hope Ends, Cute Robots. It's a beautiful movie. I agree with that. I love Wally a lot. I would love to, we've got to do a ranking of Pixar movies one day. But uh, I've got other stuff to do. All right. Sandor comes back. I completely agree and love Wally, but I just didn't see what it made it dark and nihilistic. And that's a good place to end. Toy Story 4 is terrible. Armand is right. Maybe for different reasons. I love italicized title for the movie and then it's regular, regular books. And I love this font as well, as well. Very official. And I can listen to the article as well. Fuck yeah. Woody and Bo Peep. And you're forgetting that there's a third character in this goddamn picture, Armand. Oh, who cares? It's Giggle Meat Dumples. Who cares about Giggle? Piece of shit. Well, Armand. The Rotten Tomatoes appeared in your... Would we call them Rotten? Oh, that's not fair to you guys. I thank you all for commenting. It's not my thing, but I just... So I could extend this video out for a little bit more. Everybody, thank you so much for whoever watched this. This was very loose and all the place. So, sorry if there was some gaps or if I said something that was mean. You just got to deal with it because this is the first time I've ever sort of streamished something or other. So, yeah, all I'll say is thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I'm going to end this thing now.